Okay, uh, good morning and welcome to the 11th meeting of session six of the Qualities, Human Rights and Civil Justice Committee. This is the first meeting of the committee in this session where there have been people observing in person and you're all very welcome. <clears throat> if I can ask members of the committee and our guests to ensure that all mobile phones or other such devices are switched to silent for the duration of the meeting. And we have no apologies for this morning's meeting. First um, agenda item is to agree whether to take items four, consideration of today's evidence, and item five, consideration of correspondence from the Health and Social Care Committee in private. Is that agreed? That is agreed. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is consideration of a negative instrument, and I refer members to paper one. Do any members have any comments on the registration services, fees, etc., Scotland amendment? Regulations 2022. Okay, no member has indicated that they have any comments to make. That being the case, are members content formally not to make any comments to the Parliament on this instrument? That is agreed, and that concludes consideration of the SSI. The next agenda item is to take evidence on children's participation in the court's decision making process. I welcome to the meeting our first panel, Sarah Axford, Service Manager, Children First. And um, joining us remotely, Dr. Leslie Ann Barnes McFarlane, Senior Lecturer in Scots Private Law, University of Glasgow, who is joining us remotely, as I said. And I refer members to papers two and three. Um, to, to kick off, I invite our, our witnesses to make short opening statements, um, if they wish to, uh, starting with Sarah Axford, please. Thank you. I would like to start by thanking the committee for inviting me here today. My name is Sarah Raxford, I'm a service manager for Children First, which is Scotland's national children's charity. At Children First, we stand up for children's rights and highlight when we feel they are being violated by decision-making processes. We do this through regular contact with organisations such as the Children and Young People's Commissioner for Scotland and the Scottish Women's Rights Centre. We believe that when families do well, children do well. And the way we do things is to put relationships at the heart of everything we do. Children First are, the tr are a trusted and established provider of children's services in the Scottish Borders, providing abuse and trauma recovery support to children, young people and their families. We are considered the only service with the skills and expertise in creating safety for families in supporting their recovery, particularly when living with ongoing abuse through child contact. This is because we have developed a high quality, experienced and qualified staff team who deliver a unique, person-centred and holistic approach, and it is with these expertise that I come before the committee. There are two ways in which children and families with support come into contact with the family justice system. Child contact cases and residency and permanency cases, which I hope I can all also touch on in this session. For the majority of children and families that access support through our domestic abuse services, their experience of the family justice system has left them feeling unheard, insignificant, distressed and worried about the future. Many children tell us that they don't feel part of decision-making processes, even when decisions are being made about them. And that they feel overlooked. This has a significant impact on their development and happiness, especially when unsafe or concerning decisions are made about contact with their parents without their consent or without effort to understand why, why they may be reluctant to see a particular parent. So why I look forward to sharing with you the child-centred, relationship-based, non-judgmental and non-stigmatising practice that makes up the Children First way of supporting children to participate in decisions about them. I would hope to share with you some examples where children we support have had their input disregarded by those making decisions which affect them. I would like to share the voices of two young people who have had very recent experiences of not being listened to within the civil court process. The first young person, well both young people have had their views heard, well taken several times but not listened to. So first young person said it feels unfair I feel because I'm a child my view is unimportant if an adult didn't want to see a parent it wouldn't it wouldn't have to go to court it felt like I was treated like property not an individual I feel disrespected and disempowered and this is from an, an from another young person I feel the sheriff didn't listen to me and my right is to be heard and listened to and that didn't happen I feel listened to by other people like my mum and school and everyone else except the sheriff, and he has let me down. Thank you. Thank you. 
And can I hear from uh, Dr Barnes McFarlane, please? Yes, good morning and thank you very much for inviting me today. Um, and as the Chair said, I'm a child and family law researcher working in a team of researchers in the field at Glasgow University in the School of Law. And before I became an academic over a decade ago, I was a family lawyer. I represented adults and children involved in family court cases. And I also worked as a child welfare reporter and a curator at Lighton. And um, I've been asked along today because I was commissioned in 2019 by the Justice Committee to produce an independent report um, when the Children's Scotland Bill was being considered by the Scottish Parliament. And my report evaluated the current law, which was and still is the part one of the Children's Scotland Act 1995. And I was asked to review the 1995 Act and to comment on areas that might be in need of, of updating and possible reform from a, a human rights perspective, and, and particularly from the perspective of children's human rights and the child's right to participate. Um, and the areas that I considered uh, for potential reform included, for example, the imposition in current law um, of an age presumption of, of 12 years and older for, for the capacity to form and express a view, um, and also the, the, the general lack of infrastructure to support and guide and inform children who are involved in family court cases. Um, and my report also um, analysed the 2019 Children's Scotland Bill, which, which is, uh, uh, of course, the Children's Scotland Act 2020 now. And most of that Act is not yet in force. Um, but once it is in force, um, it, it does have the potential to make positive changes in respect of enabling children to participate more fully in family court cases about them. Okay, thank, thank you both very much. Obviously, we'll be asking some more questions in depth, but I wonder if initially both of you could just give us an outline in practical terms how we try to hear the voices of children and where that maybe doesn't work in, in, in practice. Uh, Sarah, do you want to make some, some initial comments on that? So the ways in which... I suppose the, the 1995 Act outlines that children's views can be taken. So um, I suppose the current methods are the F9 form, child welfare reporters, and then kind of either speaking to, um, you know, children are entitled to have their own legal representation too, or to kind of speak to a sheriff in private. So in practice... Um, the only way, in our experience at the moment, that children's views are being taken is, is through child welfare reporters. Um, we don't consistently see the F9 form used, and we, you know, we don't particularly agree that the F9 form is a, 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 an effective way to take children's views anyway. But, um, yes, yeah, so child welfare reporters is the most common way we see children's views taken. Um, again... I suppose in our experience, that's that's pretty inconsistent too. Um, commonly, children under the age of twelve don't have their views taken. We would see that, you know, and even speaking to a solicitor fairly recently about a five-year-old's views, you know, it was it you know that was kind of pretty much dismissed from the from the outset, really, that that child's views would be even considered. So, yeah. See, in terms of just the to form, before we, we, we go to um, Leslie Ann, um, the, the F9 form, does that just need to be completely replaced? Is that your view or yeah. what's... Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's, you, you know, we, we get... Uh, it relies on a, you know, it relies on adult support to, to be able to kind of complete that form, you know, and often families... Um, don't understand you know how to fill it in and, and what should be on that form um we see a reluctance from i suppose professionals like teachers and things like that to kind of help fill in those forms because they would it would be kind of sometimes viewed as them having a bias towards one particular parent over another so yeah it's really difficult okay um Leslie Ann, and if you could comment on the, the, that form as well, that would be helpful, the, the, the F9. 
Okay, um, thank you. Well, I'll comment first on, on the current methods to take um, children's views, um, wh which Sarah's very helpfully outlined as, as including the, the F9 form, the possibility, of course, of speaking to, to a sheriff, um, but not many children do that. That's what we know from what, what limited research exists. Most children uh, give their views through speaking to a child welfare reporter. Um, children can instruct their own solicitor, but that tends to be older children. And again, relatively few children actually do that. Um, in terms of some of the, the areas in which the system uh, could be updated uh, and improved, and again, the, the Scottish Government's Family uh, Justice Modernisation Strategy um, you know, flagged up a number of these areas, um, the, the presumption of age 12 plus which, which um, I mean, an age limit is not given in Article 12 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which, which is the article all about the child's right to participate. Uh, and among lots of different countries in the world, we are really the only country that put an age benchmark in. And that would be contrary to the guidance that's been, that's been given by the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, which, which is the, the sort of international watchdog on children's rights. Um, so certainly the age presumption has not been helpful, although there are certainly um, reported cases where courts have taken views of younger children and there's certainly guidance to child welfare reporters um, to do that. Um, when the 2020 Act comes into force, it will in fact replace that presumption with a different presumption entirely. And the new presumption will be that all children have capacity to express a view. So what we should see is that all children, regardless of age, being asked what they think and how they feel about their family law case. Um, and of course, what that means is that, that, that within a legal system where asking the views of younger children has not traditionally been done, there, there's a whole new area um, for training uh, and development. And, and I wonder if Sarah might want to comment on that further. So, so the, the, the age 12 presumption has been a, a difficult uh, area increasingly. Um, the, the lack of a supportive infrastructure for children who are supporting views, that there isn't anyone in the current system who is there to support or inform children, to help them articulate their views, to explain the process to them, to give them appropriate information at the right stages, and importantly, to explain a decision to children once it's been made and to let them know uh, that they're being heard. And, and again, one of the um, reforms that the 2020 Act uh, it should be bringing into force is this appointment of a child advocacy worker who can fulfil that role and who can help create an environment where children actually feel supported and listened to. Um, and I can certainly follow up on some of the other areas uh, as we discussed further this morning, for example, in the provision of explanations to children, which, which is a new thing that the 2020 Act will bring in. Um, in terms of the form F9, um, I, I, I watched the round table uh, when that form was criticised by a number of people, and I don't really have any specific points of criticism to add to that, but I do agree with the criticisms, um, and uh, I, I agree that the form F9 is, is certainly not the best way to take the views of children. It is the current way that court proceedings are intimated to children, so if it's going to be replaced there will have to be some other way that children are told about the court process that is happening about them. And, and, and certainly we would expect that to be part of the discussions when the 2020 Act comes. OK, thank you very much. And as you say, we'll be covering some of these issues in more depth um, with questions from other members going forward. So I'll now move to um, Karen Adam, please. Thank you, convener. Um, good morning to you both. Am I, I am switched on. Yeah, it, It's nice to see you both here today. Um, I'd like to ask a question in regards, um, well, within the context of the pandemic. And, you know, this is obviously it's highlighted quite a few um, issues uh, for a number of demographics. But in the, the context of um, how it's affected children's participation in, in decision making, has there been any new issues highlighted or have there been any extra difficulties that, that you have seen? Is that for me first? Uh, Sarah first. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I suppose one of the things I think happened in our experience is that children's views were taken less. So there was less, there was less kind of, you know, um, child welfare report, you know, you know, the, because of the less, you know, not face-to-face -face meeting and things like that, you know, children's views were just not taken rather than, 
you know, a way found to, to take their views. Um, I think the impact of online hearings has been really difficult. I think a lots of the parents that we've spoken to have found that really disempowering and felt less able to voice um, their views at, at online hearings. I think, you know, prior to even online hearings happening, we're st you know, I suppose we're still hearing of, you know, teleconferencing happening in certain places or, you know, when the kind of online technology doesn't work, then kind of reverting back to tele telephone conferences. Um, and again, people find that even less, you know, even less able to kind of engage with that. What we've seen as well is long delays in in hearings happening, you know, big gaps in between hearings. Um, yeah, so that's, I think that's probably the, the main issues we've seen. Thank you. And uh, Leslie Ann? Um, yes, I mean, I think I would, I would, I would vouch to the views of people who are actually working in the system and who, who have experienced you know, the delays um, and, the, and the pros and cons of technology, uh, I suppose, in particular. Um, and I guess that, that that creates opportunities to work in different ways, but always it should be done in a way that, that is based on what the needs of the particular child are, rather than sort of the convenience um, or cost. And, and I think certainly, again, when, when the, the, the new Act comes into force, that it will be a provision that children's views should be taken in the manner that the child prefers and the, the child should be able to see whether they want to have a meeting with an individual, whether they want to send an email, whether they want to talk uh, to an online meeting and so on. So, so I think, again, you know, those are, are positive steps in the way forward. OK, thank you. If we can now go to Maggie Chapman, please. Great. Th thanks very much. Good morning to you both and thank you for joining us this morning. I've got a couple of questions, I, I suppose, that, that build on some of your comments around h how, how we hear, how we hear children's voices and, and actually give their voices due weight as the UNCRC requires, r requires that, that, that to happen. In Glasgow, there are specialised hearing suites for criminal cases and I'm wondering if you have any, any thoughts about... Um, using pre-recordings, using um, remote evidence giving, I, and I take on board what you say about the, the, some of the issues with virtual hearings, uh, Sarah, but, but these specialised hearing suites, do they offer us an opportunity for sheriff courts as well as criminal courts to enable participation of, of the child in, in any in a, in a safe place, in a, in a safe space, in a, in a more relaxed environment. I'll, Sarah, I'll come to you first and then Leslie Ann. Absolutely. I think, you know, I would stress that they need to be child friendly spaces too. I think, you know, um, I think we need to recognise the importance of creating child friendly spaces in order that, you know, children can share to the best of their ability and the best of that, you know, you know, creating that kind of ideal ideal environment is the, the most important thing so I think yeah I, absolutely and I think you know giving children the opportunity to you know I think children do feel completely detached now from from the the process you know they kind of hear about it and you know they might get a kind of 30 minute an hour long meeting with the child welfare reporter to hear their views but you know that doesn't always happen and then you know they feel quite detached from the process and you know um, relying on their parents then to kind of communicate that to them. So I think if there was a space where a child could go and and give their views and they know that that's directly connected to the kind of court process, then... Be before I bring Leslie Ann in, can I just, just pick up on something you said, you know, with the, 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 the time with the child welfare reporter, you said that doesn't always happen. Um, is, there some, is there some more that we should be thinking about uh, around ensuring that it does or is it not always appropriate for it to happen? Well, I think the, certainly in our experience, kind of, our, you know, and that's, that's, it's localised. I mean, we've got kind of wider children first experience, but I think certainly in our experience, you know, there isn't a consistent approach to, to when and why child welfare reports are done. Um, and, you know, a child welfare report may be done, but without speaking to the child. So that would be, I suppose, looking at the context Again, it's not particularly a consistent approach to that either. So, um, 
you know some so, you know some appointed child welfare reporters might do it in a particular way or which wouldn't necessarily match the next person that came along sort of thing so it's not um and then you know i suppose there's that there's that view that children under a certain age don't have the ability to to speak to a child welfare reporter or you know they're not able to form a view so that it's just you know it's just not it's just not done Thanks, Sarah. Liz Leanne, your views on, on, on the specialised hearing suites and, and associated possibilities, I suppose. Yes, uh, well, I, I guess my view would be that anything that, 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 that serves to make the process uh, of participating in family court cases, you know, less intimidating for children and more accessible is, is absolutely worth considering. Uh, and I think certainly one of the most encouraging things to read about, about these suites, is that it was children and young people um, who were actually involved in the development of those suites and in the consultation process and, and that they co-designed the website and they chose the images on it. Uh, and that uh, is certainly very much children's rights compliant in terms of what um, rights of the child uh, would say, which is you know, that the best way to put in place the best methods for listening to children is by planning and working and developing those methods with children and, and listening to what they're saying makes them happy or frightened or involved or, or, or uh, you know, as, as Sarah has said, detached from the process, which is absolutely what we don't want because it's a process about them that above all it has a massive impact on their day-to-day -day lives. Thanks, Lise Leanne. If, if I can follow up with, I suppose, a connected but, but separate question around advocacy services and that the 2020 Act makes provision for, um, for, for advocacy services to be provided as ministers consider necessary. And I suppose I'm, I'm interested in what you think about what provision, whether that provision should be in, uh, enforced, wh whether we whether there would need to be um, restrictions or stipulations around it, and also how we balance the, 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 the rights of the child to be heard themselves with the rights of the child to be supported I, I, and hear their views either through an advocate or is the advocacy there to support them to have their views heard? Just interested, Leslie Ann first, and then I'll come back to Sarah. Thank you. Okay. okay, well, I mean, in terms of, of the advocacy service, I, mean, I guess we're talking about a lot of ways in which the, se the system can be improved and modernised. Yeah. Um, and in fairness, this is a system that, that came into force over 25 years ago with the Children's Scotland Act 1995. And, and at that time, it was quite radical to be listening to children at all. Um, and over the last 25 years, we, we've begun to realise that participation actually means more than just taking a view from children and using that in, a, in an adult-centric process. What, what it really means is involving the child in some kind of dialogue where they understand what's going on. Um, and so, you know, it certainly seems to me that the plan to create children's advocates solves a number of problems with the existing system in a single stroke. It would give an individual dedicated to a child, that, that individual would explain the process to them. It would help them, if necessary, articulate their views and feelings in, in a court process, which should be about them, all about them, but it's still quite adult-centric. Um, that person would offer support, appropriate information, um, and would also explain uh, to the child maybe what a decision means in the context of, of the impact it's going to have on their life. So I can't see anything negative about having a children's advocate. And I would go so far as to say that I'm not sure that the, that the provisions in the primary legislation in the 2020 Act are actually going to make that much difference to children if there isn't a change to the basic structure that is carrying children through the process that they are experiencing when they're involved in really distressing cases about, about their life. So yes, it's a, for me, it's an absolute, um, an absolute necessity to, to enact these services for children. Thanks very much, Leslie Ann and Sarah. I completely agree with what Leslie Ann is saying. I think that you know, addressing children's advocacy is, is is really critical. And you know, if we're serious about improving children's participation rights, it's um, you know, I think that advocates can be a key part of children sharing their views in a number of different and I think it addresses a number of different issues that you know are around for kind of Scottish government around you know the you know the children's hearing system you know um you know obviously civil justice processes but also just you know 
that that advocacy in when for points in their life when things are difficult you know when you know whether whether social work involvement or you know police involvement or you know something that's kind of you know a concern for a child so um you know i think that you know a, an advocate can work with a child as well to 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 help them decide how their views are shared as well whether that's that child sharing that in person you know building that confidence to do that because it is about confidence it's about you know that ability to do that and you, you know we would always want children to be able to to share in person but you know it's about giving the child that that you know that set of resources to do that so that's about a relationship with the child and working you know working for a period of time to to to, to build up that relationship that time being given and and i, I suppose j just just finally it it does d do you see that as a potential way of of dealing with some of the challenges that that have been that we've we've talked about at, at a previous session here the the tension between welfare the child's welfare and their, their rights to be heard their rights to participate absolutely because it yeah. can take you know that person can contextualize that 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 person's life that child child's life you know it, mm -hmm. that you know it's about that person working alongside a child to to understand what their views are but the context to that as well the, you know what what are the other things that are kind of going yeah. on within that child's life which is often just lost within the current civil justice yeah. system yeah. okay thank you both very much i thank think you. leslie has a small last comment to come back in Yes, I, I was just going to comment on the children's hearing advocacy um, service, which has now begun and about which there is incredibly positive feedback. You know, and it's been noted that having an advocate improves the quality of discussions and the decisions um, and, and helps children to realise their own rights. It's all about facilitating children. Thank you. OK, thank you. I've, can I go to Pam Duncan Glancy, please? Thank you, convener, um, and good morning to the panel. Thank you for joining us, and um, it's nice to see uh, people in what I think is called the gallery um, for, for the first time since, uh, certainly since, since I've been here. Um, but thanks for the evidence this morning and for, for all the work that you've done um, over the years. My question um, is, uh, there's, there's, I have two questions. One of them um, is specifically about the Children's Scotland Act 2020, and it's for, um, for yourself, Sarah, if that's okay. Um, Children First gave quite a lot of evidence, obviously, to that bill. Um, and made a number of recommendations on it. Not all of them were, were um, taken on board, but some of them were. Could you tell us a little bit about the impact that you think the changes that were taken on board will have when they come into effect? And could you also set out any implications you think there could be from the delay of introducing them? I mean, we're chomping at the bit for the Children of Scotland Act 2020 to be to be implemented. You know, it can't come soon enough for us. I mean, it, the delay. I mean, the, really, the delay is 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 impacting directly on children and young people. It's you know, we know what's said. You know, in the 1995 Act, you know, there's some really explicit in Section 11. There's some really explicit stuff about listening to children's views and including kind of children's welfare within the considerations, but you know, we're not always seeing that consistently met now. So, you know, we're really kind of keen that, you know, I suppose the, the 2020 Act, for that to go further. But, you know, I suppose my concern is that, you know, that we're not seeing that coming quick enough and we're silencing children as a as a consequence of that. Um, I, from memory, I can't remember what we... What we did, what didn't get in, what we sort of recommended that didn't get in, and 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 did get in. That I have to kind of rely on my colleagues to kind of feedback on that. But um, you know, certainly we were um, pleased that some of the stuff around kind of presumed um, presumption of shared parenting was in that. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, the the stuff around parental alienation being taken out. So yeah, thank you. Thank. Thank you. Do I wonder um, if do do you have anything to add to that, Dr. Burns? Um, not in particular. I mean, I think it's very much recognised that the 2020 Act is um, the first step in a process of beginning the modernisation of the family justice system, and that it will be important in terms of of compliance 
with the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child to keep that system under review. But as Sarah says, you know, we obviously the pandemic has caused a lot of disruption to working life and processes. But um, I think I'm just very keen to see the 2020 Act come into force. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, and the, uh, the final question I have um, for, for this panel is around the presumption, of course, that children have capacity to express their views is going to be a huge step forward. And we've held, heard a lot this morning about, about the structural changes that we might need to do that. Could you um, maybe say something about whether or not you think there needs to be specialised professionals who've got experience of taking the views of particularly young children um, in the context of um, both criminal and civil justice cases? Um, and maybe if you could both cover cover that if that's okay. Be keen to hear your thoughts. Do you want me to start? Yeah. Um, yes. The short answer to that, we, th we, we would, we really strongly advocate that children, that, that you know, that professionals taking children's views should um, know how to speak to children and, you know, and how, you know, and, and understand, you know, child, child's development. Um, I suppose the complexities of of safety and welfare around children. Um, you know, we we absolutely think that ch ch children younger than twelve are able to form views, and you know, it's not just about kind of interviewing a child. That you know, we we think that children should be able to kind of give give views in written form or in you know drawings and things like that and we've had recent experience of a you know a permanency case where we were able to we were able to support a child's view through some of the kind of pictures that that child had done that were clearly saying that he didn't want a relationship with his father so you know he was able to we were able to kind of communicate that in the in the court setting to say this is what this child has as represented in picture form, um, it, it, it needs, like I said before, it needs those relationships need to be given time. A child doesn't form a view. You know, we don't think we're giving children the best chance by by being interviewed for for half an hour by a, a child welfare reporter. That doesn't, you know, I think we, that relationship needs to be built. That you know, that safety and. Um, security needs to be felt within that relationship in order to kind of give that child the best chance of being able to communicate their view effectively. Thank you. Um, do, do Dr. Barnes at McFarland, do you have uh, anything to add to that? Um, yes, I mean, I, I think just to add one small point, which is that, that taking the views of younger children and involving them in any kind of legal process is, is a really new mm -hmm. um, concept in law. So, so yes, that there definitely would be a need for and, and opportunities for, for training um, of, appropriate, of appropriate professionals within this, this sort of new, new approach that we're developing. Could I ask one, one follow-up to just to the, yeah. the answer specifically there? Thank, thank you, convener. Um, what, what sort of training do you think would specifically be needed, and, and is there anyone in particular you think would be best to provide that? Well, again, I'll, uh, Sarah might have more information about specific providers uh, of training, but I think it would be a requirement to understand uh, aspects of child development in dealing with younger children, in particular about how younger children communicate. And as Sarah said, younger children are less likely um, to articulate their feelings in language that adults maybe will immediately um, be able to, to understand and process. So I think we, we need to begin to learn how to listen um, to younger children. And I'm not sure if that's a thing we do as a society particularly well. I think the legal system is just, just, just one facet of that. But yes, I think it would involve a multidisciplinary approach with people who understand uh, more about child development you know, than lawyers do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Alexander Stewart, please. <clears throat> thank you, convener, and good morning, and thank you for your comments so far. You both touched on the issues about children being overlooked, being disregarded in this whole process, uh, and you've also talked today about the, the child welfare reporter, and now that is seen as the future, uh, as to support and try and balance that difference. Uh, but do you believe that that will be the case? Uh, because 
it is giving the opportunity for the individuals to express their views and opinion. But is it maybe not the same that there's not a relationship there? Or how, how do they build that relationship? Because I, what I get from both of you today, it's about confidence. It's about the child feeling confident. It's about the child feeling that they are given the chance to express their views. Uh, because in the past, it would appear that these, these views have been disregarded or ignored. So if we are putting a lot of emphasis on the Child Welfare Reporter, uh, what needs to happen with that to ensure that it is successful and that there is uh, progress? Because without that, we're back to where we started. So maybe Sarah first. So our view, you know, our view would be that, you know, we could draw on, a, a, in, really, I don't think it matters what profession somebody comes from. I think what's important is the ability to, to form a relationship with a child and understand how to communicate with a child at, at, at different ages and stages. Um, and I think that comes from training. I think that comes from having a system that is more accountable than it is at the moment and more structured. Um, that there is, I guess, more, just, you know, I think, I think what's really important is for somebody to go into to being a child welfare reporter who has an interest in children's rights. You know, I think that's where it needs to come from. Where I think, you know, what we're drawing on at the moment is, is, you know, no disrespect for the to the legal position, but we are drawing on solicitors, who, you know, it, you know, the, the child welfare reporting is incentivised by, you know, it's incentivised financially. So we've got, you know, in in the area that we work in, we've got we're drawing on a very limited pool of people, and they are also representing. You know, as defence agents, as and you know, and that you know, for me, that's a, a real conflict of interest. So, you know, I think the important thing is, I don't think it really, you know, the profession doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what we kind of draw on. What matters is that is that interest in working with children and, and getting children's views. And Leslie Ann, obviously, your idea, you you are you are a lawyer and you have that that background. Uh, you've heard the comments that Sarah's made there. Do you believe that? <laughs> the reporter and the child welfare reporter is being managed in the right way, the focus is in the right emphasis uh, to ensure that, that that relationship can be built? Well, I mean, in terms of the way that the, the system is set up under the 1985 Act and that it will continue to be set up under the 2020 Act, child welfare reporters fulfil um, you know, an important function, but they do lots of things. They don't just take the views of children. Um, the court rules say that their job is investigative. They carry out investigations, usually um, investigating family members, teachers, other professionals that might work with the child. And then importantly, they, they make recommendations to the court about what the court rules call effective and expedient resolution of an issue or a dispute about children. So, and actually, once the, the, the 2020 Act comes into force, there will also be an additional role, uh, which will be where the court asks them to, to provide an explanation to children of the court's decision. So that, that, that's an awful lot of roles that they are exercising. And what they absolutely are not is a child's advocate. Their role is not to support children and be the person that gives them information. Yes, they're a very important professional in the process, and if they were replaced, uh, you know, but something else would have to be there to, to, to facilitate the court's decision making. But they're not there to be the child's representative, supporter or advocate. So there's still a big gap there for someone who can make the process less upsetting, intimidating for the child to make the child feel that they're being heard. And, and that's not really the function of a child welfare reporter. Um, I would absolutely support the steps that the Scottish Government is taking to have a register and in terms of, of having a more, more uniform training, um, and particularly in terms of taking views from, from younger children. But um, my view, and I understand what, what, what Sarah is saying, what the children's organisations are saying as well, is that a separate role entirely, a children's advocate, uh, or whatever you want to call it, is needed um, to support children um, through that process. 
I have no particularly strong views whether um, the child welfare reporter is, is a solicitor or someone from another profession. I think the important thing, uh, as Sarah says, is that they have an interest in children and they, they understand about children's rights and also that they, they understand about the process and can investigate and, and give, give recommendations to support in that process. And you know, the, the Scottish Government have talked about the necessity to, to broaden the scope of the role and to try and bring in other professionals. Uh, you've touched on that. Uh, at, at the moment, it's primarily the legal service that has the lion's share of that. Uh, but there's, there's been talk about broadening that to social work or psychologists uh, to try and bring them into the role uh, to, to try and once again tease out or uh, embrace uh, some of the, the focus that's been identified. Uh, do you think that's a successful way of trying to move it? Because by taking it into a different area and giving more opportunity uh, for individuals to participate, and that may well be successful also. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's something definitely worth, worth discussing uh, with the Scottish Courts and, and Tribunal Service about the, the benefits that other professions can bring in, particularly when it comes to expertise in, in, in talking to very young children. Uh, yes. Sarah, so, do you have any comment on that, bringing the different professions to the, the process? No, like I said, I think it's about it's about that kind of interest in working with children and, and interest in children's rights. Okay, thank you, convener. Okay, thank you. And Pam Gosal, please. Thank you, convener, and thank you very much, panel, for your opening statements today. My question is around the judicial specialisation. Some legal systems around the world and in the UK make greater use of specialised family courts or specialised family judges. We know that in the larger urban areas in Scotland, some young people have access to specialist sheriffs, but others don't, don't have that. What impact would the wider rollout of the Greater Court of Judicial Specialisation have on children and young people's participation and decision making in Scotland? And uh, my question goes to Dr Leslie first. Well, I think absolutely a system in which people um, understand and know more about children and their rights and how to communicate with children cannot be a bad thing. So, um, you know, yes, absolutely. Gre greater specialisation for those working with children, I, I think, is definitely uh, something something worth discussing and considering. Absolutely agree. I think, you know, I think we need to offer equity of service across Scotland. I mean, we, we're working in a rural area and we've only got kind of two sheriff courts in the area and really only one or two sheriffs presiding over all criminal and civil cases. So um, I think we would absolutely welcome specialisation. I think, you know, it's really important to differentiate um, this particularly kind of complex area of, of civil justice um, with you know it, it needs to be kind of protected and and, and 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 treated differently absolutely thank you can i just got one more question is that okay just going back to something obviously my colleague spoke about pam duncan glancy back to the 2020 act and um you know we've heard about dr leslie talking about that she actually gave comments in to make sure that certain things like children under the age of 12 views are heard just now with obviously Karen talking about my colleague talking about the pandemic and um, with now after the 1995 Act, um, you know, being there and now the 220 Act um, hopefully coming into force but not in force yet. Is there anything that you feel that now moving on today that should be actually in that 2020 Act? that you didn't feel at the time, even, you know, I'll start with Dr. Leslie Ann when she talked about she reviewed the Act. Is there anything you feel that you would bring now into that Act that wasn't there before? Uh, do, you, do you mean in view of the pandemic and, and the challenges? I mean, that the happened? pandemic and obviously the view of now the child hearing and the systems and, um, you know, the child hearings and all the systems, how we did hear from yourselves earlier on talking about that. Sarah did mention that children were not heard when it came to online and everything. So do you think the Act now needs to be changed or amended in any way that now taking that into account that such a pandemic can happen and where we are today? 
I mean, I think fundamentally the provisions in the Act are, 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 a, are a great step forward. I, I think where the concern lies is that the, the supportive infrastructure um, below the Act, because when, when we think about people's experience of going to court, um, yes, they're told about the, you know, the, the, the primary legislation and the kinds of orders that they might get at the end of the day, but, but at the end of the day, for family members, might actually be months or years down the line, and their day-to-day -day experiences of going through a process how well they understand the process, how well they're represented, um, how well um, it's explained to them. And, and for children, um, it's an incredibly long process. And, and although they are the subject of that process, um, very often they don't feel part of it. They don't feel that they're involved or listened to. I and mean, that's what we hear time and time again. So I think, yes, absolutely, the 2020 Act is a great step forward. And it is something we'll have to keep under, under review. There will, there will be areas that will need to be tweaked and amended over the years, I'm sure. But, um, but, but it's actually the supportive, uh, the supportive elements, the day-to-day -day sort of management of cases that that, that have to be um, considered, uh, and that's why I think we, we've been talking quite a lot about a support worker, children, about some somebody who can actually make sure that children can navigate their way through a process that actually adults find stressful and baffling uh, at times. Thank you, Dr. Lizzie. Sarah, is there anything? I don't think there's anything I would add to that. I completely agree with what. Lizzie is saying, I think it's just really important that we um, enact what is what is already written in, and you know, and, and and try to kind of you know speed up that process of implementation. You know, these things are you know there was a, it was a long consultation process. I think you know so many of these issues were around before the pandemic and have only been exacerbated by a pandemic. So um, I think it's really important that we just. Um, try to put some of these 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 new bits of legislation into into force as soon as possible. Sarah, just um, one more question on that. Earlier on, you did mention that obviously through the pandemic, that when children obviously went online, they felt they weren't heard. We heard from witnesses earlier on in some sessions. They talked about that online sessions. Uh, a lot of people found it better. And some people obviously, like you've said, not. Have you got any views on that? I think it's about choice. I think it's about giving young people choice. And I think we've got, you know, I suppose the use of kind of virtual technology and that, and that, I suppose, the speed at which we had to kind of implement a lot of that, I think, uh, you know, it has given us um, more options in, in terms of how we, we, we engage with children and young people. And, you know, we, we kind of had to do it. But I think, you know, some young people are more comfortable in that space, some aren't. And I think it's just about being child centred and, and offer you know, it's another option that we can offer to children and young people. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Thank you. And if we can now go to Fulton McGregor, please. Yeah, thanks, convener, and uh, good morning, uh, panel. Uh, it's it's fair to say I think we've covered uh, a lot of ground here in the two questions I'm going to ask. I do apologise in advance because um, part of it has um, has already been covered, but I did want to ask again about the child welfare reporters because um, I, I was uh, an MSP in the last committee that, that, that seen the legislation through, and this was an area um, that we had a lot of discussion about, as the, the panelists will, will will probably remember themselves. Um, and I'm just wondering, uh, you know, we talked there a wee bit about who the child welfare reporters. Uh, are, and that discussion was obviously heard um, when the bill was been brought through as well. You know whether they're, they're legal professionals or social workers or psychologists. But I wonder, in in, in more broader terms, Sarah, if I could come to you first, if you could uh, think about whether the, you you know you feel now that it's the correct approach, um, and what are the main features that you think uh, the child welfare reporter system needs to have in order for it to be a success moving forward. Happy to go to Sarah first, if that's all right, Sarah. Yeah, that's fine. I was just, um, I was just thinking about my answer. I suppose, you know, like I said before, I think the most important for, thing for us is that is that ability and that ability to speak to children and that interest in speaking to children and then that kind of, um, that protection of children's rights. I think what's important for us as well is the. Is is parity of service for children and young people? You know what 
you know what we see is a, is a very inconsistent approach to 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 that child welfare process so i think you know what leslie ann said about about child welfare reports having an investigative um role as well is that we don't you know in our experience we don't always see that as as, as happening and you know and i think that um or we see that investigative role happening and then not the children's views bit happening so it's kind of you know what would be you know important for us is that is that structure to it and that that equity and of service for for children and young people that they know what that role is for and why and and you know that that process is explained to them and that they get you know um that they understand it and you know are able to kind of contribute to that that they feel that it's about that participation in it it's about that you know that relationship with that person you know in that particular role. Doctor Barnes McFarlane. Um, I don't. I don't really have a, 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 any points to add to that. You know, I think um, yes, that the, the child welfare role at the moment, in terms of of the system, uh, is 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 a necessary role as far as I can see. But it but it isn't a role that is purely focused on the child's protection. That there is a need for something extra for another person who is more specialist, who is more dedicated to the child, because actually, as we can see, in terms of all the different functions that the child welfare reporter actually fulfills, um, you know, taking the child's views is just one of those. Um, and again, if we're bringing the views of younger children into the system, you know, it's, it's not really reasonable to think that people in a legal system that has never done that before are just automatically going to be able to do that. Which is why, you know, you know, I think we need input from child development specialists. We need training from how how to communicate with and, and understand views as expressed in lots of different forms. Younger children. Yeah, yeah uh, thanks for that. And I, I suppose actually your answer there leads me on nicely to my final question, which is around about. Um, the, the bringing the section 21 into force, and I know we've, we've touched on that already. And obviously, the Scottish government um, have expressed a, a policy concern about um, about bringing this section into force because um, the fear, if you like, that the, the children could end up with multiple support workers. Now, going from my own experience, that's not not, not an uncommon scenario anyway. That. The, the children have multiple um, professionals or agencies uh, working with them. But do you think that in this context, um, that this is a valid concern, um, or, 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 or do you not? Do you think it's more about an integrated approach um, as a way of addressing it? Happy to stick with yourself. Sorry, sorry uh, Doctor. Uh, um, yes, I mean. I I don't really see that as a valid concern. I think that children need to have access to advocacy support in, in whatever forum uh, that uh, they find themselves. And that's regardless of whether it's the children's hearing system, the criminal system, or, or the family court system. And, and there are a number of advocacy providers across Scotland, uh, and their views could be sought on whether you know they see there are any practical uh, or substantive problems with, with with them, for example, providing advocacy services, uh, you know, to the same child as you see, an integrated way across, across more than one uh, one particular forum. But, but yes, I mean, certainly, what we do know from the advocacy service that's been provided uh, through the children's hearing system, although it's relatively new, is that you know the Scottish government one year review of that that is stated to be essential to children properly understanding and realising their rights within that process and that it is improving the quality of discussions and decisions and that's very much what we want to see within the family court forum as well and that's very much what we think is, is missing. Thank you. Did have you get any views on that final question? Not much more I would add to that really. I think it's just important that children and young people have it's, it is about that advocacy role. I think it is about absolutely prioritising that and that person being able to 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 be um, alongside a young person on their whatever journey that it is they're going on, whether that's a, whether that's a, through criminal process or whether it's through civil process. So, or whether it's both, you know, um, 
so you know that's a, it, it's, it's about that trusted person that relationship so you know and I think that that would it minimizes that risk of re-traumatizing children you know children have to tell their stories multiple times you know you know being asked six or seven times the same thing by different people is is not okay so we need to be able to kind of give children that you know that 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 consistency okay thank, thank you. you very much nice to be done. thank you is there any members got any final questions or are we no okay Th thanks to both the witnesses for your evidence that's been really really helpful and um, we'll now suspend for about five minutes until 11 o'clock thank you So we're going to be restarting in about...
Okay, thank you. Um, we now welcome um, to the meeting our second panel. Um, and we welcome Alistair Hogg, Head of Practice and Policy at Scottish Children's Reporter Administration, May Dunsmuir, Chamber President of the Health and Education Chamber of the First Tier Tribunal for Scotland Additional Support Needs Jur Jurisdiction, who is joining us remotely, and Jordan Crone, Advocacy and Participation Manager, Who Cares Scotland. You're all very welcome. And again, I invite witnesses to make short opening statements if they wish to do so, starting with Alistair Hogg, please. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, Al my my name is Alistair Hogg. I'm Head of Practice and Policy at SCRA. Uh, the children's hearing system, as I'm sure committee members know, has been in existence for over 50 years now. So we very much welcome the committee's invitation to give evidence today and to share uh, our own experience over the last 50 years. Uh, which has been a real journey in terms of our uh, encouragement and improvement activity in relation to obtaining children's views and obtaining wider meaningful participation of children uh, in our uh, hearing system and processes. Um, I wouldn't want the committee to think that we are claiming that we've got it all right. We certainly do not do so. We try to get it right as much as we possibly can. And over that 50 year journey, we have made lots of improvements, changes, adaptations. We've had lots of engagement with children and young people, both individually and collectively, and with organisations who champion children's rights. And, and we are still on that journey of improvement, uh, which has been re-energised through the promise uh, and our activity in relation to that. Um, what I would like to say is that, having heard the first session today uh, and, and pre prepared for today's meeting, that really, uh, although this is an area which is not easy, uh, not, in, not in the slightest bit, it's, as I say, we're still on a journey after 50 years, but in, in some respects, it's quite straightforward uh, and it's not that complicated. If, if you're trying to obtain meaningful participation of children, you need to provide the right foundations that allow them to provide those views and to meaningfully participate. And, and I'm sure we'll explore those foundations in, in the questions and discussions. Uh, but essentially, children need to be properly informed. Uh, they need to be uh, assisted and supported to help them understand what is going on. They need to be properly prepared for whatever process they're engaging with. Uh, they need to have their rights protected and promoted. They need to be supported before, during and after. Um, they need to have a consistency of that support. They need to be allowed to build relationships with people who will help them to participate and provide their views. They need to have the right environments. They need to have the right conditions and the right tools which will assist them to provide their views, to create those conditions that enable their, their voice to be heard. And their views need to be valued. And there needs to be a way of ensuring that, that they know that their views are valued. And all of that, of course, takes investment, and it takes investment of time and investment of resources. And that's what we found over the years. Um, I'm happy to share any of our experiences and to provide any detail of that if it's helpful to the committee. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can we now go to uh, May Dunsmuir, please? Thank you very much for inviting me to give evidence on the experience of the additional support needs tribe. You know, we're not as... Um, old as SCRA, um, the Additional Support Needs Tribunal in uh, various forms has been around for 17 years now. And we've learned that meaningful children's participation has to begin at the beginning, not midway and not at the end. In our jurisdiction, children and young people sit at the heart of our processes. They have the most authentic voice, and that's very important here authenticity. They hold the expertise. Beginning at the beginning can feel quite risky from an adult perspective. You don't hold complete control and a child or young person can sniff out a fraud easily. I, I expect today that you'll want to hear about the sensory hearing suites that we've created and our journey to get there. And I'd like to refer to this briefly to illustrate what I mean about beginning at the beginning. After many years myself as a children's reporter, a mental health lawyer, and then as a member of the judiciary, 
one thing was crystal clear. Children and young people's voices are often drowned out by the sheer volume of personal and professional adults in their lives. When I became president of the former Additional Support Needs Tribunal for Scotland, which it was before it transferred into the First Tier Tribunal, uh, and I became president in 2014, I then made a public commitment to learn how to deliver justice by listening directly to children and young people. Now, what I meant by directly went beyond the great value of listening to children's organisations and the children's commissioner, teacher, parent groups and so on, and into the company of children themselves. And I began this journey by meeting first with the Young Ambassadors for Inclusion and then moved on from there. I started with a large white blank sheet of paper. That was the only tool I took when I went to speak to these children and young people. And I asked two questions. The first, do you want to come to hearings? Whichever type of hearing that is, do you want to come? Do you want to participate in hearings which make decisions about you? Now, when I spoke about hearings, I meant children's hearings, additional support needs hearings, court hearings. I wanted to hear from children's experiences themselves, whether they wanted to be involved. And after that question, I asked, if yes, what should a hearing look like? And I have to say, from every group and individual child that I've listened to, the answer to that first question, do you want to come to hearings, was actually a resounding yes. Now, that took me aback a little because I expected there to be a high volume of yeses, but I did expect to hear some noes, but um, that was a very resounding yes. And the answer to the second question, what should a hearing look like, led to what we now call our sensory hearing suites. That big blank sheet of paper began to look entirely different to what I thought it would right from the get-go. And it's from that that we built layer upon layer an accessible justice environment, each layer designed by children and young people. They own what we now have, and they themselves deserve the credit for that. I have to say, like uh, Alistair, we are on a continuum of improvement. Uh, improvement isn't static and we are continually learning and improving on what we have. And I want to stop now with some quotes from children and young people. One teenager, when asked what would help him to, what would help him to feel equal in a hearing, said a suit. Another, when asking for a table, said the table should be round, like King Arthur's round table, where everyone is equal. And finally, one child, when asked what would help her to feel relaxed and involved in a hearing, said a drinking straw. Access to justice isn't always complicated. Thank you. Thank you. If we can now go to Jordan Crone, please. Good morning. My name is Jordan Crone. I am an advocacy and participation manager for Who Cares Scotland in the South East region. And on behalf of the organisation and our members, thank you very much for um, inviting us to contribute today. Who Cares Scotland is the country's national, only national independent membership organisation for care experienced people. We currently have over 3,500 members and our strategic vision is to, is to secure a lifetime of equality, respect and love for all care experienced people in Scotland. At the heart of our work, are the rights of care experienced people and over the years we have seen the power of their voices bring about change for our community. Now we provide relationship based independent advocacy services and a range of connection and participation offers for all care experienced people across Scotland. In the past year we have provided advocacy services for over 1600 young people and our helpline also offers a lifelong advocacy service for care experienced people, for adults who have lived experience of the care system. 
We also work alongside corporate parents and others to improve the understanding of care and challenge the stigma faced by care experienced people every day. We work to create opportunities for our members to influence policy makers, leaders and elected representatives both locally and nationally to achieve positive change and build on the aspirations of the promise. Now, my role is to manage a team of independent advocacy workers in my region who work day to day with children and young people to help them play an active role in the decisions are made about them and around them. When describing our role, we often um, describe it, and it's interesting that May talks about the, the kind of the noise around young people at um, formal process meetings and hearings. What we describe ourselves as their own megaphone. We are there to raise their voice and we are not interested in the noise around them. It's their way of raising their voice. And it's just a really nice way of explaining it in very simple terms, because like Alistair may have said, a lot of the answers that we may be seeking here can be quite simple. Independent advocacy is different from advocacy. And I guess the, the, the simplest way I can describe that is, is that we are skilled professional advocacy workers who have no other purpose or role within the young person's um, journey other than to help them understand their rights to realise those rights and to represent their views in an informed way. So making sure they've got all of the information they need to make an informed choice and, an, and to express those views to the people around them. Independent advocacy is defined by the Scottish Independent Advocacy Alliance as speaking up for and standing alongside individuals or groups and not being influenced by the views of others. And like I say, we believe this is a key tool in helping children and young people claim and understand their rights. So I hope um, that after this conversation, we um, are able to offer a little more clarity on advocacy, but also the difference between that and independent advocacy um, and how we can best help ensure um, Article 12 in the UNCRC and realise the um, the rights of young people to express their views in a way that suits them. Um, we have 40 years of experience um, as an independent advocacy uh, agency, so we're not quite at the 50 yet. Um, and I don't have anywhere near 40 years experience, so anything that I can't answer, we will uh, offer written evidence to the panel as well. So thank you. Perfect. OK, thanks to all three. Um, we're now going to move to questions. Um, committee members will direct their questions at... at uh, witnesses, um, but if, if they haven't asked you and you want to come in, then, then just indicate and me if you just put R in the chat if, if you're wanting to particularly come in or come back in. Um, so the first person, if we can go to um, Maggie Chapman, please. Thanks very much, Joe. Good morning. Thank you very much for, for joining us today and thank you for your, your opening remarks. There's, you've already given us a, a, a lot of information and, and a lot to, to think about. Um, following on from the, quest the questions I asked the first panel around advocacy services, and this, I'm, I'm going to ask all three of you if that's okay. Can you, can you just tell us a little bit more about the, the, advocate, the, the role that the children's advocate performs under the current uh, hearing systems and the, and the tribunals? And what, what, is it, what can we learn from that? What, what are the pros and cons of, of having a system that has a significant role for children's advocates? And... I mean, it, w w when I come to you, Jordan, actually, maybe I'll start with you, given that you, you spoke with spoke about advocacy. Jordan, what you talked about the distinction between advocacy and independent advocacy. How do we how do we draw that out in, in this children's advocate uh, issue? Thank you. No, thank you. Um, so I guess to, to start with that last point about how do we draw that out, I, I guess the, the simplest or the thing that I'd want to get cro across the most is that just that the independent advocacy worker only has one role and doesn't have, as what we've kind of described as, uh, as having a lot of different roles. And that, um, I think, helps to readdress some of the power balances that young people face around with adults around them. Understandably, they feel sometimes at the, at the bottom of that power balance, but they have one person within their, within the, their professional um, sphere um, that is just there to help them to help them make sense of their views because sometimes they don't know they can change they have every right to change their views as well so it's really about investing time in that process 
in, in order to actually make make young people really um, be able to to grasp that and understand it. Um, and that's where I guess you know advocacy within the CHS and like I say we've been providing advocacy services both locally and nationally for for over well, for just over 40 years now. So we've been doing it in various different ways and all across Scotland. Currently we work in 29 of the 32 local authorities and obviously with the introduction of, the, of advocacy within the CHS, we've got a lot of other providers in, in different local authority areas as well. Um, the main thing around that is time as well. There's a five-step process and without going through all the steps, it's a beginning, middle and an end. Um, but however, the 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 aspect of relationship-based advocacy is about giving the young person choice to be able to continue that as well. So I think when we previously spoken about how does, you know, is, are there going to be multiple advocacy workers for young people or that really is, a, is an issue we've already faced within the CHS. We're already dealing with that. And it really goes back to the principles of the promise, but it's, it's all of our, um, it's, it's all of our roles to be able to speak to young people and to be able to advocate for them, to make sure that people are listening to them. But the independent advocacy worker, what we would suggest that the importance of this being independent is, is that they're skilled professionals, that that's their sole purpose. Okay. Thank you. Alistair, do you want to come in on that as well? You'd be happy to. Um, so firstly, um, as, as Jordan's alluded to there, within the hearing system, Advocacy has been around for decades. So what, what has changed uh, just over a year ago was the implementation of Section 122 of the 2011 Act, which allowed for that national provision, so that ability to access advocacy right around the country, whereas previously it was only if that service was available within a particular local authority area. Um, the advocacy uh, service has been a, a resounding success in, in terms of the Section 122 provision, but prior to that as well, I think it was widely recognised that the uh, benefits that, that, that advocacy workers would bring to a hearing were substantial. Um, the, the advocacy worker is there to support and represent, um, to assist the child, and that support, as Jordan says, before, during and after is absolutely crucial. We know that the consistency um, of, of relationship is very important. Uh, children and young people tell us that all the time. To build a relationship and to have that consistency is, is pretty essential. Um, having someone independent with them can be extremely helpful for, for the child or young person. Uh, and there's something also in terms of of a, what children and young people tell us in terms of what inhibits them in participating which is about the power dynamics that can go on. Uh, that's not just within children's hearings, that's within any kind of court or tribunal setting. And that sense that there are others who are in control, there are others who have the power. Uh, and what, what can you say that may change that? An advocacy worker or, or some kind of rep representation for a child uh, can really help to address that, that sense of power imbalance, to, to address those power dynamics. So... Um, they have been very successful. I, I, I can't remember if there was another part to your question, sorry. It, it was that connection, that, that independent um, element, but I think, I think Jordan, Jordan's covered that. Thanks. Um, May, can I come to you now? And, and thinking about particularly your, your experience, I, I've, I've got a question about access to justice, which, which you ended on, um, which I'll, I'll come to, but, but specifically around advocacy in the additional support needs settings. How, how how is that yeah. distinct or different, or what 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 benefits do you see it, it playing in in those settings? Uh, advocacy is critical in the additional support needs tribunal, um, and our primary legislation, the Scottish ministers are obliged to make provision of advocacy services for um, children and young people who are, are going to be involved in our proceedings. Uh, and I've served in a number of jurisdictions over the years, and I would have to say that uh, it's in this jurisdiction we have seen advocacy um, most available. The, the, the problems in other jurisdictions over the years were that it was difficult sometimes to um, find provision, and the statutory basis of provision wasn't always entirely clear. 
So I think that we start with a very clear premise here in having an obligation to make that provision. And from our uh, perspective, I, I, I've never had any real difficulty in, in finding um, advocacy services across um, Scotland, although there was a period of time where briefly we struggled to see advocacy provision in the North East, but that was um, largely resolved. Um, I actually produced guidance on independent advocates in our proceedings in 2018 to reinforce um, understanding and the value of the role. I, I, I could not better the comments that Jordan has given about the role of the independent advocate, and it is that which makes their, um, their relationship with that child so valuable and so important. And we emphasise throughout our proceedings the importance of independence, uh, and, and we always talk about the independence of the tribunal. That we've got nothing to do with health, social work, education. That that we stand or we sit um, wholly independent uh, of all of these. But the independent advocate has an even stronger value to the child in that um, element of independence. I, I think it's also important to acknowledge that. Developing a relationship between the child and the advocate does take time, and, and that's something that that Jordan commented on. There is a beginning and a middle and an end. Uh, and one of the questions that uh, was asked earlier about the, the role of advocates in different proceedings, my hope would be that there is a place. Um, for a single advocate to be with a child on their journey across multiple jurisdictions, because ultimately that advocate is there to support the child, to give their views, not to um, act as a representative. Uh, that is quite a distinct and separate uh, role, but it ought to be possible for that one person. We have learned over the years that children need a consistent individual adult in their life whoever that adult may be. And I think that the advocate could actually be that um, consistent person. Uh, one thing I would say as well is that it, the committee might be interested in the work of the Scott Review looking into the Mental Health Act and uh, their um, focus on children and young people. They have actually um, made a suggestion uh, in their consultation document about whether there is value in a single system for children, instead of children having to go through multiple systems, going through one system that would actually deal with multiple areas of law. Now, that might seem a bit blue sky thinking. I personally do not think it is. I think we ought to be very ambitious when it comes to children and young people. But I mention that because I do think that an advocate can journey across more uh, than uh, one system. So, very, very valuable. Very involved. I can't think of many uh, hearings where a child does not have, have an advocate. Okay, I think we've they just... are most likely to have. And if it doesn't have their own independent advocate, we will instruct an independent advocate to go and take the views of the child. Now, while we are the ones instructing that, that does not compromise or interfere with the independent relationship of the advocate with the child. That, thanks very much for that, May. That is really, really helpful. If, if I can, my final question uh, for now, probably, um, is just to pick up on, May, your final point about access to justice does not need to be difficult. It, it, it sometimes involves really easy um, and, and once we think about them, very obvious um, adaptations and, and um, th things to, to put in place. What lessons do you think that that the sheriff court system should be learning from the, the additional sports need tribunal system to enable and enhance access to, to justice in, in that safe, informed and consistent way that, that all three of you have already spoken about? Well, I think I think we all need to learn from each other. Um, our journey of learning has come from a variety of sources. Who cares? Scotland are 
Uh, Jordan speaking for them today. We learned from Who Care Scotland. Uh, we had a young uh, adult come to speak to us who taught us that um, the impact of re-traumatisation is so considerable that whenever she walked past the place where children's hearings were held, she was physically sick, even as a young adult. So I would say learning from one another is absolutely critical. The tribunal is different from the courts. We are a specialist um, tribunal. We only deal with children and young people in, in this uh, setting. Uh, and using that specialist knowledge, we have grown and developed over time. And so I think we need to we need to continue to share with one another, and, and to um, illustrate that the Judicial Institute has regularly asked um, the tribunal to come and deliver training to courts on what we've learned in terms of the impact of um, the environment for children and young people. But what I say to the courts and what I say to others who ask is, I say there that actually I've learned it's not rocket science. Sometimes they're not um, highly expensive magic ingredients. What we've developed, for example, in the sensory hearing suites could be recreated, perhaps not to the spec that we've created them, because we, we, we had an investment of resources to do that. But I've said to others, you can, you can find a round table. If children are saying they prefer a table, but they don't want it to be a rectangle and they want it to be round because they feel as if there's parity, take away the different sizing of chairs, have all the chairs looking the same, um, have less adults in the room, stop drowning out uh, the voices of children in that way, ask them what they want uh, before they come along, help them to understand what they're going to face what they're going to uh, what the place is going to look like who the person is that they're going to be giving their views to use social stories that's a, that's a great tool that we've used um, regularly throughout the pandemic because we've had to help children and young people to give their views on screen uh, we, we we learned that they were better at that than we were we were far less comfortable than children and young people were they um, taught us a great deal more about the use of screens. So um, I, I think we need to share our learning. And I think that um, there's an awful lot that we can learn from one another. Uh, and ultimately, uh, learn authentically, as I keep saying, the authentic voice of the child. Listen uh, to what they're telling you. Uh, and when you've developed something, don't think that's it. You've cracked it because you'll discover that there's something else, perhaps, that you could do better. But the young person who came up with the round table, when they came to the launch of the sensory hearing suite in Glasgow, walked in. I was more nervous, I have to say, about his view than I was of the Minister for Children and Young People, who was with me at the time. But he walked in, looked at that round table, tapped it and said, this is cracking. This is absolutely cracking. So, you know, I, I, I'm happy. To, to continue to share what we are learning from children and young people. And I think the courts are open to that. I think that we are all keen to get this right. We are all keen to do it better. Super. Thanks very much. That is me. Okay. Okay, thank you. And Pam Gossel, please. Thank you, convener. And uh, thank you very much, panel, for your opening statements. I asked this question to the previous panel and just asking that question again. There is a common theme that was raised among uh, witnesses at the previous session arising from the pandemic. Uh, it was whether a child should have the autonomy to decide for themselves the manner in which they wish to be heard. And that could be online, it could be in person, and also how they wish to be represented. The implementation of Article 12 in the UNCRC would strengthen the child's right to have their views heard. Do you think that being more flexible and adaptable to what the child is comfortable with is key to the court making the best decision in the interests of the child? And I would go to my question first to May, because I know, May, you spoke about straws, round tables, suits. So it's a, how, do, how do they feel and how relaxed are they? So the question is to you first. 
Well, well, that very question goes to the heart of what we do. Um, I always say to my tribunal members that anything is possible which is possible, and that's the premise of our proceedings. So we always um, give the child uh, uh, the opportunity to decide how they want to be heard, where they want to be heard, the best way in which they want to communicate. Um, and if that if we look at before the pandemic, and we're beginning to um, reintroduce some aspects of in-person hearings, we're on a journey towards that. But a hearing room can look exactly as the child wants it to look. Um, they can have their own imaging on, we have a sensory wall in our hearing suites. So if, if a child said, well, you know, the, the colour red helps me to soothe, or I'd like to doodle. I've got a great doodle. I'd like to put in the wall, which is where this um, concept came from. Came from a, a child who was doodling a, a, the, the mane of a lion, of all things. He said that the doodle on the wall would really help that um, child to relax. So we can personalise the hearing room itself. We also have a breakout area in that hearing room, which has bean bags and a little fridge where they can access. Uh, water and snacks. Children with autism really find snacking very helpful, um, and they like to bite in some biscuits and sweet things. And all of the children said they needed fresh water. Uh, and and the principle of that breakout area is it belongs to them. It doesn't belong to us. No other adult can use that area. And children were telling us that they get fed up with adults telling them when they had had enough. And sometimes children would get upset when they heard people talking about um, personal things, but they wanted to be able to remain in the hearing. They didn't want the fact that they'd become upset to result in them having to leave the hearing room. And so this breakout area is a valuable area where children can go, but still remain in the hearing room itself. They can choose to sit at the table, um, they can choose to sit uh, in, in a sofa area that's to the side if they prefer to sit in a soft uh, seated area. When it comes to online proceedings, um, they can choose, of course, which room they're going to be in. They can choose if they want to speak to everyone with the cameras on or they want the cameras off. They can choose to send a video. They can choose to use talking mats. They can use Makaton. BSL, various different forms of language. Um, and ultimately, I can't think of anything yet that we've had to say we cannot uh, do. Uh, just before the pandemic hit, uh, much to my disquiet, because I was the legal member on the hearing, uh, the child who was coming along wanted to bring a guinea pig, a very large guinea pig. I was told it was about the size of a rabbit. Um, not my favourite animal. But um, that, that was fine. We learned from listening to registered intermediaries who are specialists in communication with children and young people that bringing a pet to proceedings can sometimes help to produce the very best of evidence because the child is most relaxed. And so we allow pets. And during online proceedings, we have dogs on screen, we have cats on screen. Um, various animals, as um, children feel, uh, are going to help them help them the most. I actually brought my own dog into an online hearing at one point to help um, a child to relax, um, introduce my dog to them, help them to settle down, and they were much more com comfortable after that. So, I mean, I could go on endlessly, but I think that gives you the best sense of the approach that we take. Uh, and really, we do say that anything which is possible is, uh, is and ought to be possible. Thank you, May. Uh, just going to that question to Jordan, because Jordan, you mentioned that in the last year, over 1,600 people um, uh, came to you for your service. And anything from them on this or their view on whether they would like to be online or um, actually in presence there? Yeah, and I think it really goes back to, and I think this was the original answer from this morning as well, of choice. And I think the pandemic showed that, we, that it didn't really give young people that choice. We were all forced into a situation where we had to, we, we had no other choice than to go online. And so, however, that 
does lead us now into hopefully, uh, you know, we are now um, going into a situation where we can meet in person again. It's great to be here today, I've got to say, in person as opposed to being on a screen. And for young people, we now have a system, particularly obviously within the CHS, of being able to support young, per young people's choice, whether it be online or not because each young person is so different. And also, depending on the circumstances around them, depending on what is going on in their life, their choices to be either online or in person might change from one meeting to the next. So I think it's it's really great that we've got that choice. And hearing May's examples of, of how you know you can you can help involve young people is just incredible. And I wouldn't, I, I've, I've really not got much more to add on that, other than I guess um, we also have loads of really inventive and creative ways of gathering views for young people and then helping them to choose how they want to express it whether it's you know arts and craft based activities you know we had we've we've got some advocacy workers that use minecraft as a digital tool to help explore their thoughts and feelings and they can build this digital world and they can show that to to members of the of, of the panel at children's hearing however i guess in terms of the court system one thing i would highlight is is that flexibility is key, but also consistency. Um, and particularly right now, when young people are, actually have um, are, use our services for, for, for family law or for anything to do with the courts, and we've had a lot of examples of where there has been barriers even to be able to access advocacy. So they have the advocacy relationship. They, we had a specific example of um, a referral was made by a social worker, by a social worker for a young person that was already receiving advocacy, already had a relationship with our local worker, um, and it was around contact, it was around contact arrangements with mum. Um, that young person spoke to their advocacy worker, explored how they were feeling about it, decided that they didn't want any changes to be made to their to their order on contact. They liked the fact that at that, at that moment they could choose when they wanted to see mum, and that was important to them. However, when the... Um, when those views were represented, they were fed back to the social worker who, who represented that to the court. The written views were not accepted because the sheriff decided that because they hadn't um, asked for those views, they were not going to, to listen to them and instructed a, a child welfare reporter to go out and speak to the young person. And although the advocacy worker was able to support the young person, they couldn't say anything. And that can also have an impact as well because we build relationships with young people and we, and we figure out but, you know, between the two of us, how we want, you know, how, what's best for them, what works for them. Um, another example is of um, a, a young person um, who's in receipt of, a, you know, has an advocacy worker, um, is autistic, and when they're in meetings, they like to listen to the question, write their answer on their iPad, and then show it to their advocacy worker who says it out loud. You know, a perfect example of actually the very essence of advocacy, of being that that megaphone um, however that particular meeting they wouldn't have been able to do that because the cons and that's where flexibility is key but also consistency in ensuring that it's not up to the um, either whatever the, the role is whether it's a sheriff or a child welfare reporter to ensure that young people are given that flexibility and consistency to be able to do it time and time again Thank you Jordan just over to you Alistair you, you did speak about having the right you know, being on that journey and having the right foundations in place. You talked about, um, you know, children being um, prepared and informed and supported before and after. So what's your views on um, the online and in-person attendance? So just as me and, and Jordan have said, you know, choice is absolutely key. Um, you need to have a range of options. Um, so talking about online or, or being in person, um, certainly pre-pandemic, that was a choice that we were trying to work towards. Um, that was technologically proving very difficult and challenging. And then the pandemic arrived and that changed instantly overnight. It's incredible how you're able to achieve things in, in a crisis. Um, and that technology and the, the, the journey uh, of virtual hearings has been on a real improvement trajectory ever since then. To now a much more bespoke and, and supported offering. We definitely had feedback from children and young people that um, it is their preferred way of engaging with a hearing, not for all, um, and not every time, as Jordan says. Your choice will change uh, 
depending on, on, on what the circumstances are for that individual child at the time. So we, we absolutely continue to offer that choice. And that choice can be to attend your hearing in person, it can be to attend a virtual hearing, which is fully virtual, or it can be that you can virtually attend a hearing where other people are physically in a room. So te technically uh, enabling that is challenging, but we have been able to achieve that um, quite successfully. Um, there, there's a lot also in terms of the actual environment. So if, if the uh, individual child does wish to physically attend the hearing room and the hearing centre, then there's a lot that we can do and that we do do to support that. Um, we haven't gone to the lengths of having dogs and guinea pigs in the hearings, but there's no reason why we couldn't consider that if that's what's going to help the child to participate. Um, but we do, we, we have um, embarked on a, a project of changing every single hearing room uh, in which we operate children's hearings. Um, we're, we're nearly at the end of that first cycle of that journey to have them all done. Um, contrary to the uh, information that, that um, the young people said to me, uh, rather than having a round table, the children and young people that fed back to us said, no table please, we don't want a table. Um, because that was felt to be uh, uh, imp impacting on the power dynamic again. So, so we don't generally have large tables uh, in our hearing rooms. Um, we uh, arrange and, and organise and plan them in accordance with what children and young people tell us to do. And that can be relating to the furniture, relating to the colour scheme, relating to the pictures on the wall. But also they're, they're what they uh, wish most of all is that a hearing centre is safe um, and that it's warm and that it's welcoming. Uh, and, and those are the environments that we try to create. Uh, and we offer lots of, of ways of trying to support them. Pre-hearing visits, for example, come along to the hearing centre on a day before your hearing's taking place to, to see the environment, to choose where you want to sit, to, to uh, get a feel for, for whether that's going to fit with, with your needs and, and ability to participate. So um, as May says, there's a, there's a huge amount that we can all learn from each other. Um, and I'm learning from today as well. So um, hopefully that, that is helpful for us to share our experience. Thank you, Alistair. Thank you, convener. Thank you. And if I go to Alexander Stewart, please. <coughs> thank you, convener, and, and thank you for your information and uh, answers to date. Uh, we've talked about the, the whole idea of trying to ensure uh, that young people feel at ease and are part of the process. Uh, and we've learned through not just today, but from other uh, discussions we've had that maybe a young person could have anything between eight or ten adult professionals working with them uh, through their case or through their support. Uh, and that can be quite daunting uh, for anybody at any age, far less a, a child. So it would be useful to get a flavour from you all about the, the strengths and the weaknesses that you see at present in the system that you have and how that system can be adapted uh, and supported uh, to ensure that there is a better outcome because it's about outcomes that we want to hear for the young people themselves uh, and you've, you've given examples already today about how you can facilitate some of that but, but the basic outcome that the child wants is to be listened to and to be acted on and to be supported and potentially protected. So what strengths and weaknesses in the system do we have today uh, that need to be looked at uh, to, in, to achieve that goal for these young people? And maybe I'll come to Alistair first because, as I say, you've got the organisation with the length of experience of all of that uh, over the generations. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I mean, what, what we do know, and we've heard for many years now, uh, most recently through our um, young people, through our, our Hearings Our Voice project, um, which is a, a group of young people with either current or very recent experience of children's hearings. Uh, and who provided their 40 calls to action in, in a fantastic document. Um, and within that, there are, there are lots of indications of, of where we can make the changes that will help. Uh, one of them does relate to the number of people um, and the number of people in the room, the number of people involved in a child's life. We also know from uh, research that we've carried out, that we carried out jointly with our partners at Who Care Scotland, 
um, that one of the issues is about the number of people with whom their very sensitive and confidential information has to be shared. So the more people that are involved, the more people get to know all about your private life. And, and that can really impact on a child's sense of, of freedom about sharing their views and information. So, so there's definitely something that has to be addressed in terms of trying to ensure that we are very careful about how many uh, particularly professionals are involved in a young person's life. Um, I think that um, there's a difference between those people who are necessarily involved in a child's life um, and, and those people who, who are involved as a result of the process. So um, a, a child or a young person will have lots of people in their life with whom they have a, an existing trusting relationship and, and to allow them to be part of, of their journey and their process it, it would be really important too. So if, if a child or young person wishes someone to come with them to a hearing to support them, well, ask them who they would wish that to be. Uh, and that might be somebody in addition to an advocacy worker. They'd be entitled to have that. Um, that might be their uncle. That, that might be their grandfather or, or grandmother. Um, it might be a, a, a neighbour, a friend, but if that's going to help them. Um, but we do have to be careful about just how many people get involved. Um, I guess that possibly links back to the question earlier today in terms of the potential for there to be multiple advocacy workers and I would echo what uh, May had said earlier in, in relation to that, that it, it should be possible to have a kind of integrated advocacy service which could provide that, that service no matter what, what process uh, that you were involved with. And Jordan, you, you, you talk about trying to facilitate uh, and you are facilitating, there's no question. Uh, but but are, are there any specific areas that you believe that you could enhance uh, or, or you've already identified uh, have a, a weakness or a blind spot? Yes, I, I guess some of the strengths, as, as Alistair said, is, is there is definitely, you know, uh, it's interesting going back to it because it was quite a significant difference in a hearing centre when the, when the table was taken out. I remember I was an advocacy worker at the time in Midlothian and when that table was coming out, it was quite a significant moment. And actually, it was recognised by the hearing centre. It was really, it was IKEA-fied. It was all soft furnishings, and it was, it was, it, but it was, it was led by the young people. It was co-designed by young people, and it was a really significant moment. And there is definitely more choice, um, and a more value one on advocacy, but also on value and the the importance of, of, of young people feeling comfortable and as comfortable as they can. In a situ, you know, in situations that are not always that are, are we're talking about difficult circumstances and, and emotional topics. Uh, in terms of weaknesses, I guess, and this is all, you know, this, this won't be news to anyone because it's all highlighted very much in the promise. But particularly language that we use, um, and I, I, even at Hookah Scotland, we are going on a journey about how we, what language we use. Um, you know, we're we're not, you know. We've still got our, you know, I think we've all got a bit of work to do around language, but also how we document as well, how we write that down. And what, and there's a piece of work uh, going on called Write, Write About Me. Um, and it's it's really about involving young people um, as much as possible in, in how we actually write about them, because it's their information. And the impact, um, our, our members at Hooker Scotland have, have, have done a lot of work on, on the impact of, of receiving, of, of getting your papers um, from social work and how challenging that is and how difficult that is, particularly when there's lots of information redacted. But there's also um, just things that we would, you know, that we would not want written about us, you know, and, and that's, so there's, there's a lot of work to be done there, I would say, in general. And, and May, you know, you've, you've talked about uh, trying to ensure that the, the policies and procedures are there uh, to, to ensure that organisations and individuals feel uh, part of the process and being uh, accepted into the situation. But once again, if there is layers of individuals who are adult-based trying to manage a child's situation or circumstance, uh, what strength or weakness does that have uh, to ensure that they feel as if they are getting their information and they're getting uh, listened to and they're being confident and communicated about? Um, I think um, 
just as Alistair and Jordan have touched upon, um, we're on a continuum of learning here and trying to consistently do better. The, the strengths in the um, additional support needs tribunal, uh, there, are, there are many strengths. The first is, first of all, that a child or a young person can be a party. They can raise their own case in specified circumstances. And there are very clear um, party rights extended to them. And very recently, I updated my own guidance on this because the National Children's Agency, um, My Rights, My Say, fed back to me that the adult parties weren't treating the child parties as equals in the hearing process. And so I was invited to reinforce their rights as a party in guidance, which I then publish and which I did. So that's an example of that continuum of learning. Um, we also have, um, the majority of children who appear in our proceedings have neuro neurodiverse conditions. Many of them have autism. And I think we're beginning to learn in Scotland that we are only touching the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the number of children and young people who have neurodiverse conditions. And when we talk about their ability to participate, especially in the context of multiple adults, if we don't make the physical environment as child accessible and friendly as possible, then we're failing, I think, at that first step. And actually, we have a responsibility to think about that when it comes to the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So the environment is very important, and the sensory concepts that we have um, include that table that the children's hearing system took out. Now, when I went in the beginning of this journey, I expected the children and young people that I was meeting to say, no table, please, because I'd just gone on a nice tour and looked at all of the new hearing suites um, as they were then in the children's hearing system. Uh, but there's also a place in the hearing room for no table, I should say. There are three principal components. There's a soft seating area with no table, there's the round table, and there's the breakout area. So that reinforces choice. Um, we also limit the number of people who are permitted to enter the hearing room at any one time, whether that's online or in person. So um, it's not the case that whoever turns up comes in. It's the case that the minimum number of people are in the hearing room and anyone who's there to give evidence comes in, gives their evidence and then leaves. And that has been a very critical tool for children and young people in their journey through the hearing process, because as Alistair has said, they don't want everyone to know their very sensitive and very private details. Um, Children can give evidence how they choose, as I've mentioned before, but I haven't mentioned to you the one-to-one -one room, which we have, which is actually something which was drawn from the Barna House model that, that, that we're looking at very closely in Scotland. And it's a small room, comfortably furnished with two soft arm chairs and a number of sensory toys. It has a window, which appears as a window in the room, but it's a one-way mirror which allows the hearing tribunal members and um, representatives to watch and observe. Now, children and young people only use this room by their own choice. So they have the choice to use it. And in that room, they will be aware that everyone else is outside watching, but they only have one person in that room. And they speak to that person um, and they uh, can choose to use that. Now, I have to say that the one-to-one -one room has proven to be a very um, uh, very important to do and to the people we need to exercise. Uh, the other thing I should say is that in our proceedings, there, uh, there, I don't permit cross-examination of children or young people. So there has to be a list of agreed questions, which both parties agree upon, and then the tribunal decides who will ask those questions. If the child has an independent advocate, then that will be the person who asks the questions. 
Sometimes it's a tribunal member. And that leads me on to the point that the tribunal has very specialist knowledge and expertise. We have members who are speech and language therapists, psychiatrists, teachers, um, occupational therapists, um, people who themselves have had experience of additional support needs, either because they're a parent or a carer, or because they themselves have and have had additional support needs. And I'm also very pleased to say that we have representation on our membership of care experience, uh, because that's another critical uh, part of the, um, the, the additional support needs definition, that children who are looked after automatically have additional support needs. Advocacy, I've mentioned before, uh, is very much uh, a feature in our proceedings. Um, but I think I should also mention that one of the strengths is the specialist training that is given to our tribunal members. So they're not left with, uh, without the tools that they themselves need to have in order to make sure the child is able to fully uh, participate. I also didn't mention the sensory room that we have in our sensory suites. That's a room um, that has uh, um, various sensory components. The lighting is very particular. There's um, lots of soft toys and tactile uh, features that children who become stressed or dis distressed can go and rest in and then come back into the hearing room itself. We use social stories to make sure that they know what their journey is going to look like. We've also developed um, a, a website, Needs to Learn, that has unique um, uh, features to reinforce our independence, and which is accessible for children aged 12 to 15 at this moment in time. We were, we we're going to gradually um, bring that down uh, ages so that it's more accessible for younger people too. We're about to uh, introduce animations on our website that talk about what to expect when you come to hearing, what it's going to look like, what to expect when it comes to giving your views. And we've developed child and young people forms that they themselves can use when they are parties to the proceedings. In terms of weaknesses, though, I think the greatest weakness, and this is something that touches on what Alistair said at the very beginning about children knowing what their rights are, I don't think that children in Scotland know enough about their rights. And I think that a right is only a right when you know you've got it and when you know how to exercise it. So I think that's a weakness across not just my own jurisdiction, but across all of the jurisdictions. And I think we need to do better to overcome that. And I think one of the weaknesses is that we are only at the beginning of a journey in developing sensory hearing suites. We've got them in Glasgow, we're developing them in Inverness, but I think we need that rolled out uh, across Scotland. So while it's a strength and a great strength, the fact that we have so few is, is a weakness. Thank you, convener. Thank you. I'm going to have to ask members and, and panel to try to keep future, the going forward um, contributions a little tighter. It's been really, really good, though, really lots of really useful um, information, um, which is really helpful to the committee. Karen Adam, please. Thank you, convener. And uh, thank you to the panel for the, the testimonies we've heard this morning. It's been really fascinating, but also really interesting to hear how far we've came. I'm sure, you know, 50 years ago, we wouldn't have understood how important it was to validate a child and how um, traumatising invalidation can be, or, you know, how important boundaries are uh, and consent is. And uh, gone are the days where children are seen as just immature adults and now seen as people Within, as, as their own person within themselves. And I think something that May touched on when, when she spoke about the young person who wanted a suit. And I, I've kept reflecting on that throughout this, this morning because I think that young person wanted to be taken seriously. And I think that really spoke volumes. They wanted to be seen as an equal in that room uh, and also to have you know, the table taken out and to have that, that equal standing is really important. So. Thank you for, for all that. It's certainly uh, food for thought this morning. Um, I'd like to ask, you know, the sheriffs and summary sheriffs don't communicate directly with children a great deal. 
And we know how um, effective communication really underlies the entire legal process and ensuring that everyone involved is understood and understands is extremely important. Do you think any decision maker can be trained to work with children and young people, or do you think only specific decision makers with specialist skills are equipped for this task? Um, let's start with Jordan, please. Thanks, yeah. Um, I think for me, the, there's for us, there's two parts to this, I guess. Going back to that idea of uh, within the promise, it's, it clearly sets out that it's we, we all have a responsibility to fulfil the promise. Um, and that is how we treat young people, it's how we behave around young people, it's how we support them to give their views and, like you say, treat them you know, um, as people with their own views and respect those views. However, in order to, to navigate what are very, you know, can be very complex um, situations, um, and in order to do that, while giving the young people something that's, that they're in control of, that they can, someone that sits alongside them to navigate these things, and that's their only sole purpose, is to, is to help the young person come to an informed decision about what they want, how they want to rep represent their views, what their views are, and how they understand and how they fulfill, how they realise those rights. I think that has to be someone skilled, trained, and completely independent from other services. Alistair. Yeah, I agree with Jordan, and uh, just as he said, and, and there's a lot that we learn from the promise in this regard, and an expectation uh, that all decision makers and actually everyone involved in all of the different systems and processes should all have a level of skill and training in terms of how to interact with and communicate with and listen to children and young people. Uh, the, the, the training and skills that the promise reflects is to have an awareness of, of the trauma that may have be, ha, impacted on the child, how that has impacted and how that might affect the way that they provide their views or their ability to provide their views, how they behave, how they act, um, that they should be skilled in terms of uh, understanding how to communicate, they should know about child development, how that will impact, uh, and they should understand neurodiversity as well. So I think that, that collectively, Everyone really has a role in ensuring that they are skilled and trained in all of those areas, uh, but particularly decision makers, uh, I would see that as essential for them. Thank you. And, and May, and, and I've just got to say as well, sorry, Convener, I'll be really quick, but I just really enjoyed what you were saying about um, the aspects for BSL and Marketon. And um, I, I think oftentimes we forget that a lot can get lost in translation. So ensuring that that's really effective communication is so important. And, and it was great to hear about the work in those areas. Um, so I'd pose that question to yourself. Thank you. I wonder if I could, um, in the interest of being succinct, um, just rephrase that question and say that I think that any decision maker for children and young people must have specialist training. I know you've asked, um, can all, but I think that it has to be a prerequisite. It's certainly a prerequisite in our proceedings. You can't just come along and do your best you've actually got to learn, understand, develop the concepts, develop the practice. And as um, Alistair has said about the promise, that um, has to be trauma-informed practice. Um, so I think that it, it has to be the case that if you're going to make decisions about children and young people, then you have to have that specialist training. I think that has to be a prerequisite. Okay, thank you. And Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you, Convener, and thank you to the panel for, for your evidence so far. I'm particularly struck by the good practice that we've heard this morning, and, and, and particularly as well of, um, from from me and the ingenuity that you've that you've explained and described. And I've often said that if we can get it right for disabled people and disabled children, then we can often get it right for, for everyone. So it feels like that's a really good benchmark. 
um, to be at. And, uh, yeah, well done for, for everything that you've outlined. It's really important that we engage in an inclusive way. Um, and also to yourselves, um, from the way that you've taken uh, your approach and the learning that, that you've all shared. And, and I was struck by the fact that, you know, you all said it was important to learn from each other. Um, I, I just want to very briefly ask about the, the 2020 bill and specifically it mentioned that there were a lot of things we could learn from the children's hearing system and replicate some of those in the family court system. Um, so perhaps um, if, Alistair, it would be good to hear from you about what you think those things are, where they should be replicated and how other parts of the system could have the good practice that we've heard described this morning across um, your various different services and then... Um, as, a, as a kind of supplementary to that, um, what impact do you believe the delay in introducing the changes under the 2020 Act has had on the ability of children and young people to fully participate in, in decisions? OK, so I, I, I'm aware of the time, so um, I'll, I'll try and keep it concise. I mean, I think we've, we've heard an awful lot already in terms of what could be learned, not just from the hearing system, but clearly from other tribunals as well. We've heard a, a huge amount from me, which is incredibly impressive. Um, it, so we, we've spoken about the foundations um, and investing in those foundations. So if, if, if the family court setting wishes to try and learn and improve uh, in relation to genuinely allowing and enabling children to participate and to share their views, then there really has to be an investment in, in that. Uh, I heard the discussion earlier about child welfare, welfare reporters and their role, which is a particular role, but also whether the introduction of advocacy within the, that system would be really helpful. That's certainly a lesson from the children's hearing system. Uh, and even prior to the introduction of the, the, the kind of national provision under Section 122, our experience of advocacy workers in hearings was extremely beneficial. Um, there, there's also the role of the safeguarder within the children's hearing system, which may have some analogy, not, not all uh, in relation to child welfare reporters, but a safeguarder would be an independent person uh, trained, appointed, uh, to investigate and to engage. Uh, that would include engage, engagement with the child or young person and to make recommendations to a hearing. That might be a role that, that would be worth looking at. I'm sure it already has been. Um, and, and just about that whole issue around creating choice um, and, and adaptable choice and consist, constant choice never assuming or expecting that the, the, the same choice will be made by the child or young person as to how they will engage. So creating the right environment, the right conditions, providing the right tools and crucially the right support. Um, as I said earlier, I wouldn't claim that the hearing system has all of that right, but we've got an awful lot that we've learned. We've had a, a project which has been ongoing for almost a decade now called Better Hearings, which is all about improving and, and creating bespoke hearings to meet the particular needs of the individual child. So you create the circumstances, you, you appoint the right place, the right time, the right circumstances, you invite the right people, that all of which is going to better support and enable the child or young person to share their views. Um, so that's, and, and that will, will then be built upon by all of our work in relation to the promise both in terms of improvement work that, that's ongoing and also redesign work that's already started. In terms of your second part of your question, which is about delay, um, I mean, clearly what, what, what you know, the purpose of the bill is to try and address what are perceived to be issues and gaps. And clearly, if there's a delay in the implementation, then those gaps are not going to be filled. And as I think as one of your contributors said earlier, then as long as there is that delay, then then there is a barrier to children's meaningful participation in, in that family court process. Thank you. Would, would you like to contribute? Thank you. Just, just, just briefly, I guess, just to add that um, obviously there's, there's a lot in the 2020 bill that we are really encouraged by, but one thing that we would, um, we would hope to achieve in the not too distant future is, is a right to independent advocacy for all young people. Um, and also, I guess just another thing to note is, is access to advocacy as well. Um, I spoke earlier about um, the number of young people that um, we 
that our service was um, providing advocacy for last year was 1,628 young people, and that is with 14,458 young people in Scotland who are um, experiencing care from last year. So the numbers are still very small. Um, I'm not. We certainly wouldn't say that all young people um, would 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 want advocacy, depending on their. You know, but but they have a right to at least um, have access to it. So we would. That's just what I would add. Thank you, Convener. Okay, and now, if we can move to Fulton McGregor, please. Hey, thank you, Convener, and it's now good afternoon. Good afternoon hey, to the panel, and thanks for all the um, evidence and answers so far. It's been a really uh, worthwhile session, and I think uh, similar to the uh, to the last one. Um, Again, the, probably the, the difficulty with going last, if you like, and also um, being the only remote member today, um, a lot of the areas have been covered in great depth, and I, I do appreciate that. Um, in particular, around, I did have um, areas of questions around um, how young people um, can be helped to give their views, but I think we have actually covered a lot of that today and some really, really good examples, even talking about uh, pets, the use of tables. I mean, when, I, when I was a social worker, this was always a thing at children's hearings as well. Um, you know, the, 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 the big table in the room, and it's great to hear that we're really moving on from that. I guess what, what I'll then focus my uh, substantial question on is, is legal representation, uh, and I'm happy to take in any order. Can I ask, um, in your own experiences, how common it is in practice for children and young people to be legally represented at children's hearings in tribunals? And when it does happen, eh, what do you think are the advantages and drawbacks of this? Can we go to May first, eh, in case she has a wee contribution eh, okay, to the last question? Um, in, in our proceedings, it is very common for children and young people who are parties to have legal representation. Uh, part of that stems from the National Children's Agency uh, my Rights, My Say, um, which introduces advocacy and legal representation as a service to 12 to 15 year olds who had um, rights to bring uh, a case to the tribunal extended in 2018. So it's more common than not, and I suspect that that's um, less likely to be the case uh, in, uh, when Alistair uh, speaks. But if I can refer just briefly to another tribunal, the Mental Health Tribunal, uh, and again, there, like the Additional Support Needs Tribunal, it, it's common for children and young people to have legal representation in uh, those proceedings. And I suspect that's because there's very clear and distinctive parties in the Mental Health Tribunal and in the Additional Support Needs Tribunal, uh, and, and therefore there are distinctive rights. Uh, and one of those rights includes the right to representation, not expressly legal representation. A child or a young person could bring someone else who is not a lawyer to represent them. But in my experience, across both of those jurisdictions, it is commonly a solicitor who is instructed to represent the child in, in the tribunal. Thank you. Uh, is there anybody else from the panel want to come in on that? I am happy to come in as well. Uh, yeah, um, in, in terms of legal representation of children and young people, it is it, not very common within the hearing system, but it, it does occur, it automatically occurs in certain situations. There are certain criteria where they are met, where legal representation will be provided. Uh, automatically, so uh, in situations where uh, there is a, a risk of the child um, being uh, accommodated in insecure accommodation, or or um, where a child protection order has been taken, those situations where there is a, a really severe and, and acute interference interference in the child's life. Um, but more generally, similar to what May said, there is a right of representation. So a child or young person always has that right. But of course, that right uh, requires an ability to instruct, uh, particularly a legal representative. So, uh, and what we do find is that uh, it's very uncommon for a younger child to instruct a legal representative. Um, less uncommon for an older child to do so, but but still, relatively few occasions where that happens. Thank you. 
um, uh, probably mo much more common for them to be represented by someone else um, or, or to have a, an advocacy worker with them. Uh, in terms of, uh, I think the other part of your question was what advantages would legal representation bring? Um, I mean, as always, legal representation will bring a protection of your rights. That's that's really a kind of, in, in essence, uh, a legal representative's role is to ensure that your rights are protected and to, um, ad, ad, I guess, advocate for what you want to achieve. Um, and uh, I suppose it also helps to address the issue that I spoke about earlier, which is the power dynamic. It's much more common in the hearing system for the, the relevant persons, which are the parents or, or carers of the child, to be legally represented and for the child not to be. Um, and so sometimes that, that power dynamic is quite imbalanced. Um, so sometimes it can help to address that. But equally so, that, that kind of imbalance can be addressed by other representatives uh, and other people that, that support the child, like an advocacy worker. Can I add to that? Uh, yeah, yeah just, I guess just to add to that, um, it kind of goes uh, perfectly on to my point of advocacy, an independent advocacy worker. We work quite, quite a lot with um, um, young people that have legal representation. Like Alistair says, there's certain circumstances where young people have, you know, are automatically um, given legal representation and they can really complement each other. I guess just to, to really point out the, the, the difference between legal, uh, you know, a solicitor and an advocacy service is that we don't, we're, we're not, we don't give out uh, legal advice. Um, and I guess just to give an example of how it can really complement um, a young person in, in accessing uh, their um, um, their legal um, representative, if a young person has a meeting with their solicitor, it's very common, and I've done it myself, where um, the young person would like their advocacy worker to go along to that meeting. So for one meeting with their legal representative, the advocacy worker would would meet them travel with them to prepare for the meeting, start to discuss what they, you know, how they want to represent their views, what they want to say, what's important to them, um, support them in that meeting with the legal representative, make sure that they understand what's been discussed, um, and then afterwards travel back with them to really just, you know, gather their thoughts, have any reflections, and be able to kind of just make sure that they understand um, what they've said and, and what's been and the information they've been given. So that's how it can advocacy and independent advocacy can really complement legal uh, services as well. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, thanks for that, convener. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks everyone. Time is um, we're, we're well past time, so we'll, we'll have to wrap up there. There's lots more for us to think about in, in, in the contributions that you've all made. But thanks to all three of you for, for your evidence. That's been really helpful. I'm sure we'll be back in touch as we consider how we might look at some of this work in the, in the future. So thanks all very much. We'll now um, move into private session for the final items of our agenda. Thank you. <laughs>